a bit there. But um, like you said, I'm a research historian that specializes in military history, specifically on um, providing content to authors, screenwriters, biographers, and other content creators. Like you said, my name is business name, and my website is History Mint, History, and then Mint like candy. Um, and I would just ask that you hold your questions until the very end, and I would be more than happy to answer all of your questions. So tonight, um, we're going to look at um, Henry Clay Hood. So here's an image of him. Many of you are probably familiar with this. This is Fort Lapway in Lapway, Idaho. We have been there. So I need you to step back into the early morning of November 16, 1876, and into the eyes and into the backyard of Emily Fitzgerald. Emily Fitzgerald was the spouse of the post surgeon in Fort Lapway at the time. Emily Fitzgerald makes the following statement to her daughter many years later. But then there is one thing rather pleasant I forgot to mention. Colonel Wood felt all the while that Joseph would come to terms soon as he knew they were in earnest. And the last evening here after the Colonel was all, the council was over and the gentlemen were going in early in the, in the morning, Colonel Wood said a dozen times in the evening, I'm expecting to hear from Joseph every minute. I am certain he will come to terms knowing that this is his last chance and that we will leave in the morning. Joseph did not come, did not or send word, and the party started off for town at 6 o'clock in the morning, Lewiston. About 9 o'clock in the rain, the four most gorgeously gotten up in him, this is her again, rode up to our back gates. Imagine the back side of this, this is the duplex. And uh, asked for General Holland. The other three were quite young chiefs. One was Joseph himself, who was a splendid looking Indian. As far as we can understand, they had all come to make terms of some sort with General Howard. They were all very smiling and pleasant and seemed very sorry not to have found him. But we don't know whether this is the beginning of a settlement, but we hope it is. Major Henry uh, Clay Wood had hoped that peace would be created with the non treaty in his person. His hopes rested on indications that his council that he had held with the Nez Perce leadership July 26th, I'm sorry, July 23rd and July 22nd of 1876, and the endorsement of his boss or supervisor, General Oliver Otis Howard, had indicated that he had his support in officially in writing on September 6th. So Wood saw an opportunity to distinguish himself through his words and uh, his fundamental belief in the letter of the law. So the night before they had met uh, the next person in the backyard of Fort Lapway, Wood had awkwardly set himself apart from the other four commissioners of the 1876 commission when he said, I quote, Joseph speaks well. He speaks with a straight tongue. The commission do the same. Joseph speaks as he did the July last, a couple months earlier. Major Wood went on to document his descent from the other four commissioners, officially and in peer journals. I quote, I recognize the fact that the Indian must yield to the white man, the inferior to the superior race, barbarism, and civilization. But power is not justice. Force is not law. The American Republic cannot afford to consummate a wrong, even against, even towards an Indian, especially a Nez Perce Indian. From this point forward, November of 1876, General Howard cordially disagreed on how Wood uh, with how to handle the Nez Perce issue. Even with this and its eventual ultimate outcome, the Nez Perce conflict or war of 1877, Henry Clay Wood became recognized by his white peers as an Indian expert, quote unquote, for his time resolving disputes between the Native Americans and the United States government. The story of Henry Clay Wood and his descent the, with the 1876 Commission, I will argue, formed the high point of Wood's career. So, what did historians say? Alvin M. Giuseppe, 
would have examined the validity of Joseph's claim with a wholly objective disinterest, and as a lawyer, the officer had moved to conclude that the band title and any part of the Nez Perce Reservation of 1855, including the Wallula, had not been extinguished in 1863. Historian Merrill Beale, thus Major Wood went on record in favor of negotiations that recognized Nez Perce land claims. And later, Bruce Hampton, it appears that Wood's argument, no matter how principled, was less interesting to Howard than finding an immediate solution to his vexing, quote unquote, Indian problem. So, okay, so, what sparked my interest in Henry Clay Wood? Well, first of all, that whole conversation in 1876 was very interesting to me, well known by most people who are familiar with the Nez Perce War. But we, I wondered why there was no backstory. Of course, the war historians focus on this one man did this great thing and then they move on in the narrative. Well, I wanted to find out more about him. I wanted to know who this person was. So, there's no biography, there's no profile, there's no real good information locally that any doubt. So you get this one-sided view of this man. And it's kind of hard to try and figure out what this person is about with just this limited image. So today, we're going to find out who he really was. I argue that Henry Clay Wood was a well-connected civil lawyer while serving in the Army as a human resources officer who used his connections and abilities to escape his run-ins with military regulations and to create the image of a gentleman officer through continuous self-promotion, active management of his personnel file, and regularly challenging Army regulations. So, the significance of this is, make sure you have the full picture before you decide what or who someone is before you go to bat for them. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and create an image of a man's professional life 138 years ago. We're going to look at some major patterns and try to pull those patterns apart and then put them back together so we can get a sense of who the man was, at least a facsimile. So, moving on. Major sources that inform this talk. Henry Clay Wood's papers, which are in the Library of Congress. The Henry Clay Wood Department of War Records, these are his Army personnel files. You'll hear me refer to that. Thank God you don't have to go through them. Congressional records. And then Oliver Wood's Howard papers, known as the Howard papers for voting. And also locally here, semi-locally, H.D. Cowley papers at WSU. And you can go look at them. So, some quick basic information and then we're going to keep moving here. Wood was born on May 26, 1832 in Winthrop, Maine. He would be born to General Samuel Wood, the militia general in Maine, and Mother Florina Sweetwood. He would die on August 30, 1918. He would be married to two women. The first woman he would have two children by. She would pass away within six years of their marriage. And he would remarry in 1870. His education, he prepared for voting at Yarmouth and received both a bachelor's and his master's at Bowdoin College. We're going to talk about that more. Very interesting. He then went to the Secretary of State's office in Maine and read the law and then passed the bar roughly two years later. Norwich, my alma mater, would give him what I call an honorary bachelor's degree. He showed up for a couple months in 1856. They said, we like what you're doing in 1874. We want to be associated with you. A couple other activities. He was involved in the Masons in Washington, D.C. and in MOLAS. Those of you who aren't familiar with MOLAS, MOLAS stands for Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States Army, which was formed after the assassination of President Lincoln and in response to it. It would be formed by Army officers and other people concerned about a second civil war coming out of Lincoln's assassination. So some really interesting connections there. And our friends 
uh, General Sheridan and General Sherman were also members of the So we'll come back. Genealogy, he really liked that. He kind of had a fascination with that. He wanted to tie himself. He was a member of the Society of Mayflower Descendants. It was very important for him to be able to say, my great, 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 great grandma came off the Mayflower. Um, so that's what some people do. So uh, the Library of Congress papers, his personal papers, have very little information on his personal life, unfortunately. You have no, there's just not a lot there, so there's more room for that. Uh, Maine would launch Henry Clay Wood's career. It would become his safe harbor during leave, and it would also become his retirement home. But in the interim, um, Maine really didn't care what he did for about 30 to 40 years, 40 year career in the Army. Long time. So, enough flattering about that. How is Henry Clay Wood relevant for all the whole life? The question of the hour. Very good question. Well, here we go. So I get to use my Daniel Reader pointer. Here's the staff department of the Department of Columbia, which is the Pacific Northwest in rough terms. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, parts of uh, Montana, and uh, James here has actually an excellent uh, map in the back room there. So, this man here would be the commanding general of that entire area. This is General Howard. The, the man to the immediate right, this is our guy, uh, Major Wood. And you can see he's sitting just to his right, which is always a power position in the military, because you're carrying the sword in that case. The man behind uh, Wood, uh, General Howard here is his son. H.F. Howard. He was his aide de camp. So, here is my 1861 map of the Department of Columbia. You can see Fort Walla Walla here. Of course, Fort Lapaway isn't there yet. We also have Fort Vancouver and the Fort Worth Department. Now, the key here is that General Howard, not that it was 1861, he got this whole area all under that one general, General Howard. On his staff is Major Wood. Major Wood was his human resources, I'm going to call it, personnel slash army called it an adjutant. And so what he would do is, that general had operational control of this entire area. And the boundaries change. The important thing is you understand what, what areas we've got here. So we're going to talk about the three different things that this man did, this Major Wood, really quickly, so you kind of understand. Here you have your telegraph and it's going to Fort Walla Walla. If you look down here real closely, you'll see it in the back. You see this on the back. By command of General Davis by Henry Clay Wood. So this is where 85 to 90, well, probably 80, 85 or so traffic came from. You have Portland sending the commanding officer here, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And it goes through Henry Clay Wood, who was the adjutant in the state. So, he acted as a convoy in this case, and um, order, the way you should think about it is the general says, this is what I want you to do, Clay sends you a route, go through it. Clay would serve here, Henry Clay Wood would serve here from 1872 to 1880, and then again from 1884 to 1886. So roughly 10 years, but not 10 years continuously. And he would serve in Portland, for Fort Vancouver, not here, but he would regularly either be sending them daily traffic, which you'll find out in the record that uh, James was speaking about. You'll see a lot of stuff that says Henry Clay Wood in your, let in your letters received here. Okay, type number two. This is an important one for Wood. Wood also functioned on that staff, that group of men. His primary function was to handle rank, personnel issues, and any type of administrative function for like Fort Walla Walla. He'd say to the Fort Walla Walla commander, I want to know about this. And generally he would have to comply. If the local post commander didn't comply, he might kick it up a notch and have, have his general find how fun it to force him to do it. Um, he, technically, Wood was not in that commander's chain of command. Um, so importantly, getting back on topic here, Wood wrote lots of lawyer's briefs, lots of suits, paperwork, histories, reports. That was the 
the thing that he did here in a small writing, he is actually taking issue with a fishery that is misplaced in the Department of Columbia and say, hey, quit squatting on our land. If you don't get off this federal government property, we're going to do bad things to you. Okay, last one. This is probably one of the most interesting ones. This is where Major Wood is in charge, but nobody else actually knows that he's in charge. Here's where you have General Howard, here's your Captain Wood, and he said, during my absence, okay? And then over here, um, you have Wood complaining about it. So what he says is basically, I'm leaving the office, Wood, you're in charge, but you're not going to get the pay, you're not going to get the rank, and just do it. And in the meanwhile, Wood can say whatever he wants to Fort Walla Walla. He can tell that commander, I need you to paint your wagons red. And the guys know none of that. So there's a very good possibility, unknown, this and the other ones where Wood would have that additional responsibility. And nobody would know. This is uh, not surprising or not shocking you know, for the Army at this point. So, a couple real quick things. Military rank. I didn't want to talk about this much today. Lots of people like this topic. It's very interesting to them. Because Wood uh, thought that the rank, rank was a currency of honor, he looked at it as a form of payment, uh, a remuneration for what he had done. So during the Civil War, this wasn't that unusual. You had what was called a brevet rank. So the army would say, ah, you did these great things in the Battle of Wilson's Creek, we're going to award you these brevets. And the brevets would come in the form of a brevet to lieutenant colonel, a brevet to colonel in 1865. So to kind of explain this to you, Wood would have the rank of major, regular army rank. That's the real rank. And then while he's here, he shows up at Fort Walla Walla or he sends you a letter, he calls himself colonel, expects everyone to address him as colonel, and then writes you as colonel because he's earned that brevet. But that's not his real rank. He's still a major. So definitely confusing. I'm going to focus tonight on, I'm going to call him Major Wood or just Wood or Henry Clay Wood because we're interested in what he did, not necessarily his rank. Um, for that confusion, you've got a volunteer rank where Wood was also involved in this where you could have another rank where let's say you're a first lieutenant and you work for the volunteer cavalry you would have two ranks. You'd be both a colonel and a lieutenant at the same time. So you could have three ranks at once. Pure confusion. So let's move on. Um, quickly, there are four patterns that appear in Major Wood's professional life. Connection, legal ability, workaholic formal and malingerer, uh, gentleman or scoundrel, and the historical record. Today I'm going to endeavor to take all these pieces, like I said earlier, bring them together, you know, some deconstructionism and then bring them together so you can get a kind of an idea of who he was. Now, talking about connections. Henry Clay Wood used personal connections to get himself out of trouble, extended leave of absence, uh, seek promotion or go to school. The way he did it was the issue. He rubbed a lot of his peers and his commanders uh, very wrong. He had this strange behavior. Henry Clay Wood consistently went around the chain of command. So Wood, the major command, he's supposed to go up the chain of command as a department commander, a division commander, and up. Wood consistently throughout his career for 30 years, 35 years, went to the top and would address the letters directly to W.T. Sherman and Phil Sheridan. Highly unusual, highly unorthodox. He would also send letters directly to the Secretary of War. So, um, this is not acceptable behavior to the Army and the immediate chain of command. All the local commanders, of course, were very upset at him because he just literally went around them. They, of course, didn't appreciate that, and it's a violation of military law. So, the interesting thing is, in almost but a few incidents, he succeeds. The General of the Army, the Secretary of War, comes back and says, oh, you're approved. And everyone below him, dozens of people, says, wow, how did you do this? So very interesting. Um, it appears that Wood may have used different types of connections. His first one would have been out of Maine. 
um, with his father, and his father had served in the main militia. This would be the beginning of, as the general, the commanding general, this would be a start. Following that, he'd go to Bowdoin College, and we're going to go over that really quick here. But the 1854 class of Bowdoin College leads like a, a who's who of antebellum Maine, a pre-war civil war. And the third example, he gets out of Bowdoin, and he goes to the Secretary of State of Maine and serves in the office there for two years. Again, making more connections. So, he's building these main connections from the state of Maine, more and more and more. Also, prior to the Civil War, um, Wood would join the Lodge of Mason, the Second Lodge, in Washington, D.C., while on leave. And then later, he would join this organization, semi-secret organization, Bolus, that had Phil Sheridan and William to come to show me. I can't prove that there's a connection there, but that's the next episode. So, Wood used to, uh, personal connections to drive his career. He was a tireless self-promoter and didn't waste any time uh, pushing, his, pushing his agenda. He was very brazen and very brash, which if he had been more coy about it, and more polite, he probably would have been in much better shape than he was. So, why you got here's a picture of the back picture of Bowdoin College. So, of his classmates in 1854, are Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, was a youth of the Civil War, 20th May, left flank, Gettysburg or Round Top, killer agent, that Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. M.W. Fuller, you may not know, he was the eighth justice, chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. Also voted um, was Franklin Pierce, not in class, but also are. He would call, uh, Wood would call on uh, President Pierce before the war, before his commission, and just call on and visit. Following that, I uh, got Professor Stowe. Professor Stowe's wife was Harriet Beecher Stowe, the, the prominent abolitionist. And then, of course, General um, Oliver Otis Howard. Um, so, it's interesting, a lot of authors put this, or there are no authors actually, yeah, about this connection about Howard and uh, Wood at Floyd. But the fact is, Howard had already left Bowdoin when Wood came in. But it looks like they had a connection later in life where they said, hey, we both went here, we're buddies, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So it's also said that uh, Howard took Wood's West Point appointment for me. Uh, Wood was trying to go to West Point instead of Bowdoin, and it looks like he, he may have taken, in fact, his uncle, Uncle Otis, up with his middle name, uh, ended up sending Howard to West Point, and that's how Wood did get to go there. So, what about this? So, moving on, President Lincoln's involvement with Wood. Now, this is really interesting. So, apparently, Wood from 1856 to about 1861 is down in Texas. He's fighting, quote unquote, the hostile Indians. Um, but by the 18, 1861, he's had enough. He doesn't want to be an infantryman. He doesn't want to shoot bullets anymore. So on September 8, 1862, Wood begins a campaign to do a branch transfer. He wants to go do something else. So he puts in a branch transfer to go to Adjutant General's office, that personnel office, that human relations, human resources office I'm talking about. So what Wood does in order to get there is he uses his extended family from Maine, from Bowdoin, from his father, from working in the Secretary of State's office, to pressure Abraham Lincoln, down here in the lower right, to approve his branch transfer. So, um, he goes out to the his main family, uh, Congressman Fesden, Senator Fesden, um, all these the big families in Maine, A.P. Morrill, the postmaster. Uh, one of them comes back and says, you know, Paymasters should have no arms and no legs. This is the middle of the war. They don't want to waste any real people for this duty, which is pretty rough but interesting. So anyway, getting on with the story. Uh, Lincoln eventually gets into pressure and approves the branch transfer here in January 9th, 1863. Um, so he reaches all the way into the uh, president's office. He's got a quote from uh, 
a senator from New Hampshire, where Wood basically says, and, and Wood consistently says this in his career, he says, I, I deserve this. I'm entitled to this. He, the very, those are the verbs he uses. So uh, he tends to have that mindset. Okay, this is a really good one. W.T. Sherman. So, Wood is uh, down in Texas, June uh, 6, 1870, 71, I'm sorry. He's, uh, he's an office person. He's a paper pusher. He's, he's the human resources guy. He then sends a, uh, a request to go to artillery school. Well, the Army said, you don't need to go to artillery school. And we just moved you to become a paper pusher six or seven years ago. So the Army was not long at all. So but here's what he does. If you look at the one on the left here, he writes a personal letter to W.T. Sherman, the general of the Army, and addresses him directly. And then on the right, this is the letter that goes to the regular chain of command. So what Wood does is he literally talks to the person at the top and the person down here. And then he comes back to the people in the regular chain of command and says, oh, I'm already approved or he thinks he is. But in this case, um, he, he was under the impression that Sherman would approve him. He didn't. He came, he came to his senses and uh, he does not get branch transfer. So, but this is a standard, uh, this is part of the course of what he, he's trying two things at once. So one of the things in all of this is he's got this hypocritical behavior. He believes in the letter of the law, the treaty law, legal justice, but at the same time, he does not follow the, follow the laws within the United States military, which uh, most people do not get away with. Well, that's another story. But, okay, so legal abilities. This is where Wood really shines. He would publish a ton of legal briefs, suits, histories of the Pacific Northwest, um, and the 1876 uh, council would be just one of those briefs. The report that he made to General Holler on the status of young Chief Joseph, January 8, 1876. So, what's interesting about this, as a, as a side note, is he's not a JAG officer. He's not an army lawyer. He's a personnel officer, but he takes all these tasks onto himself and does that. So, um, his work, if you read it, you'll find it's very logical, well reasoned, um, written in an understandable form. It's very readable for, for me, and I'm not an attorney. So, um, he, there were a number of briefs. He would write briefs on Alaska Native issues, which was part of the Department of Columbia, which you didn't see on the map. And um, he had a, such a high frequency of publishing, his peers, it just rubbed him the wrong way because he's constantly putting out material. He's often very brusque, very, uh, he encroached the boundaries of what's called military courtesy. He did things that you don't do. One, one of the other attributes is there all the briefs and most of the suits were, there's always an element of self-interest for Wood and almost all of his stuff. So you have to be very careful about that. Okay, Native American involved. Frank Wheaton, commander for all law. Maybe he comments on it. He says later, in 1890, he says, he's talking about Wood's abilities. He says, some of these complications were adjusted by you, and I know your duties were performed with admirable judgment, protecting at once the dignity of the government and the rights of the helpless, misused Indians, with no encouragement from their white neighbors who were struggling for citizenship. So, uh, comments, some of his peers had very positive comments, but once you got behind that, you find out that there's a whole other person there. We're going to go into that in a minute. So, like I said, Wood would start his career in Texas, and then following the Civil War, uh, in the Department of Columbia is where he really gets his stride in terms of working with Native Americans. He would write a history on the Modoc War in 1873, a, a briefing on that. And then in 1874, the Secretary of War, Belknap, or Belknap, would praise Wood for the documentation and his abilities. So, lots of stuff. Um, December 16, 1875, he wrote a 10-page lawyer's briefing on the Department of Alaska for the Department of Columbia that said, 
the Native, we're confused on this Native issue because we're calling this Indian country, but it's not Indian country. And you go through this whole phraseology, legalese, and lawyer talk uh, for quite a while. So, very, but, but real, very real for anybody. So, on March 6, 1880, um, Wood would come back to the Department of Columbia after disappearing for a year in Europe. That's a whole other story, but just keep note of that in the back of your head. And he would be assigned uh, to Portland, and he would go, then go up to Spokane and work with Chief Moses, uh, uh, Wiki Kahusus, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, on the Spokane tribe, to try and work on issues with them. So, recognized by his peers involved in what we call Native American issues to do. Looking at his whole body of work, his interest was focused on the letter of the law, doing things by the letter. And what's really interesting, well, not necessarily interesting, is it set him at odds with government policy, including right here, because in the treaty we agreed to this, but we're actually doing something over here on the ground. So you have this, this going on. One thing I do want to make clear, it's incorrect to understand what um, as uh, necessarily an, an advocate for Native Americans, but he's a man trying to enforce the laws and the treaties of the United States. So you have to be real careful when you, when you want to try to make a man of case. So, here's an interesting example of a case. And I had another colorful name for this, but I cleaned it up for my presentation. In 1861, Wood loses his furniture in Texas. The Confederate Army is coming on. The guys say we have to abandon the post, leave saddles, library, women's clothing, a whole ton of stuff behind. So what he does is he files suit against the United States Army as an army officer. Um, he would be the first army officer to do this in the United States history. And he was told by the department that he had a good chance of winning. Well, he never did. He would go ahead and file every year for 10 years. In 1890 was his last filing, 30 years later, and the army just basically ignored him. Um, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the diversity and the quirkiness of wood. This is just one example of many. So, workaholic and malingerer. Now these are really, how do you get these in the same sentence? I don't know. Malingerer, for those of you who don't know, is faking sickness. Faking illness. It's an old school term, an army term. So he was both of these, I will argue, kind of, well, maybe not workaholic, at the same time. Wood had a very weird service record. Most people who serve in the military, if they come home for a change of duty station or to go somewhere else, they might take off a month, maybe two months, maybe a couple of weeks in that transition. Wood would disappear for a year. And what he would do is he would combine sick leave, what's called a leave of absence, a surgeon certificate, and basically piece these things together to spend whatever amount of time you want away from the army. Um, this is a very highly unusual behavior, especially in the 19th century army. So he'd get a surgeon certificate, um, and he would, what, what he would do is he would go to Sherman or Sheridan and get it approved. So he would not go up the radio chain of command, he'd go all the way to the top with one letter, and then it would come back down. Not a good way to rub your friends. Mm -hmm. So the only time this ever really stopped was when he was nearing retirement 40 years in, and all the men who had served way up at the top that were his friends were either dead or retired and out of the army. That's the only time you have to actually deal with things. So Wood may have dealt, uh, been very hard working, in all fairness to him, on what he was doing. But he had these huge, strange gaps, and we're going to look at a couple of these. Texas, 1859-1860. So, Wood says to his local commander, I want seven days of leave. I've earned it. Okay, great. It's just like if you go on vacation if you're civilian. Kind of. He sends it there. The local commander says, I'm not going to give you 60 days. You get seven. Okay, that's a normal response. But, interestingly enough, the Secretary of War comes back and says, no, you're going to give him four months retroactively. So Wood had already left Texas, went to Maine, didn't have his leave approved, 
And then the Secretary of War comes back and says, oh, he's good to go, leave him alone. So, way up the chain. So while he's on leave, he gets married. This is not a bad thing, this is normal. He becomes a master mason while he's in Maine. And his boss to the side, from the Adjutant General Corps, says, to what? So this application has not been made through proper military channel. That is, through the post and through the department commander and the general in chief. It will be returned to Lieutenant Wood in compliance with regulations on the case. So his leave extension was rejected. But then the Secretary of War comes back and says, well, you're, you're not approved. So then he sends a third and then a fourth leave. So eventually he's gone for an, almost an entire year. Now, for those of you who don't know, a leave of absence is not leave. It's like he's left the army. Very unusual. Not going to get it. He regularly did it. So in August of 1861, the Secretary of War says, uh, we, we're not going to do this anymore. September 9th, 1860, the headquarters of the army says, you will be ready to march with recruits this fall to St. Louis. So this was a standard thing with Wood, where on his last surgeon certificate, or his last bit of information, he would literally write a handwritten note saying, you will be here because we're not sure should you show up, and you better damn well show up. So really not normal. General men are, are, are a scoundrel. We went over one example there of the uh, Texas incident, the result of the one when he came here to the Department of Columbia. He disappeared for a year for training and to write a report. There was no report. There was no sign of him. He was just gone. Prior to that, and the, the tour before that, coming out of Texas, he went to the hot springs in Arkansas. He was quote unquote sick. He was sick for two months. And he was sick for another six months. Well, this is fine if you're sick, but he's conducting business while he's there. He's pressuring the chain of command. He's doing things he's not, if you're sick, he would not normally do. Um, and he's having local people in Arkansas write the command letters saying, oh, this Colonel Wood, he's a great guy. You should let him go to artillery school. So he's constantly, he's got multiple things going at once. So, moving on quickly. Running with General J.B.S. Todd, uh, commander. So it is the Civil War. Very cool. Wood goes out, fights at the Battle of Wilson's Creek, August of 1861. Uh, Wood later received the Medal of Honor for it, another story. He ignores the, the commanding general's orders. Wood decides he's got this other set of orders and he's going to Memphis. Well, the commanding general who's local there says, I need you to return because we have things to deal with. Well, Wood replies to the general. Now remember, he's the first lieutenant in the army. This man is the commanding general of that region. He says, well, I refuse to acknowledge the letters you sent me because you haven't properly addressed them. He's telling this to the general. So the general is just frosted with him. The general Todd responds to November 4th, 1861. He says, you have taken a grave responsibility upon yourself to disobey the orders of your commanding general. But I am charitable enough to believe that you are acting under a misconception of your duties. So of course, Wood would uh, say that, well, I lost the letter. I wasn't there to take the I never got to the letter. So eventually, November 11, uh, 1861, officers arrest him, he goes to jail, they lock him up. He's in prison, and while he's in prison, he requests to be paid as a colonel in his volunteer regiment, and the army comes back and says, well, we can't pay you for your colonelcy in the regiment of cavalry because it doesn't exist. He's in there, he's also, at the same time he's in jail, he's doing all these what I call, they're obnoxious, he's being obnoxious the whole time. Um, eventually, uh, he writes a letter of apology. It, he, that's another trait that you'll find in his work. He doesn't take, he doesn't accept responsibility. He just looked off to a general officer. He should be defrocked, gone, discharged. He never admits responsibility. Somehow he gets out of it. So uh, we talked about that. The other thing that's interesting, when these incidents happen, he always makes a request to the local captain and says, you know, file this somewhere and file it with someone you trust. And he, these little interviews where he wants to have the record of his arrest. 
Jalen never shows up in his personal uh, personal papers, and it doesn't show up in his personal file. But it happened. So we get to the northwest, we get here, uh, Portland. General Howard comes in. He's got this outstanding issue from the last general between his major Eagleston and Henry Clay Wood. Um, so Eagleston is under charges for embezzlement. He doesn't like the fact that Wood is sitting at his JAG office. So Eagleston makes these accusations against Wood. They're very descriptive, very colorful. I can't repeat them here. But they involve alcohol, women, and a bunch of other things. So two of the charges actually sit. Uh, the Inspector General comes in, and the Inspector General is like a, an outside force, comes in and looks at it independently. The IG says two of them stick. General Howard says, again, back to the Bowdoin connection, he says, uh, they don't rise to the level, we'll just, we'll just shovel it away. So eventually, uh, Howard runs into his own problems with Wood. About a year later, General Howard uh, emails up to the hill to Washington and says, I regard it in the best interest for this department and the serv at this service that Major Henry Clay would be relieved and assigned to duty elsewhere. So he's run into that Wood did have at that point at least a severe alcohol problem. Uh, the headquarters of the Army won't take him back and, um, and so he can't go back and then Wood comes back later and says three days later, he wants to change duty stations. He wants out of there. Um, but this pattern is the one that keeps recurring, where he pushes the limits, he breaks the law, and then somehow at the very end, he gets he he squeaks by. He doesn't wind up in major trouble. Um, and then again, the pattern again, December uh, 22nd, 74, 75, would then ask the IG, um, Colonel Raw. Rob Jones, oh, can I get the paperwork from you on this case? And then he goes and asks the adjutant general, so he wants the evidence, so he has it in his hand. So he's trying to manage very much his image and how he appears in his record. He's very conscious of that, all done. So, here we go, trying to shape his own historical image. There are seven bound volumes in the Library of Congress, so he means seven volumes of leather hidebound books on himself, given to the Library of Congress, and his genealogy. It's in chronological order mostly. All of his suits, all of his cases are printed up. They're all professionally printed or typed. He also did this would uh, manage what was in the personnel file. So he would constantly be saying, add this, add this to all positive things, and keep trying to manage that process. You have to remember, he worked in that office. He was a personnel officer at times. Well, the whole time. And he was a legal expert. He knew what he was doing. He claimed to work late nights, many late nights by himself, closing up the office. He probably had access to the file. So I don't have proof that he uh, messed with his own uh, personnel file. However, the amount of information and things that he did by placing things into the file, positively, newspaper clippings, other things officially, um, makes me wonder. So, very, very interesting. So, highlights his own career and puts his legal filings in there. The one thing you realize when looking at Wood and as a historian and studying him is you, you have to be really on the ball. Because here's a man, you know, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with this other than he had a bunch of serious discipline and integrity issues. You're literally looking at a guy sitting across the table from you, from you 138 years ago. And what he's saying to you is, here, this is, this is what I want you, and you've probably seen this as well, this is what I want you to say about me. But it's not necessarily what, reality, what culture reality was. So you just something to be aware of. Um, cultivating this image as an officer and a gentleman, he was almost successful. He almost had me fooled, but not quite. So, uh, today, I hope I have shed light on who Henry Clay Wood was. Uh, I will argue that Henry Clay Wood was a well-connected civil lawyer who, while serving as the Army Human Resources Officer, used his connections and abilities 
to escape his run-ins with the military regulation and create the image of an officer, gentleman officer, for continuous self-promotion, active management of his personnel file, and regularly challenging army regulations. So, what are your questions? What's the um, background here? Are there any descendants here? Or? No, not that I'm aware of. Excellent question. Um, they would all be back east in Maine. Yes, yeah, they'd be Kuhn's two sons. He would serve out here. Not that we're aware of. Descendants we're not aware of. There may be perhaps the legitimate children that we don't know about, but no. Just those two children in Maine by the first wife. And he wouldn't raise those children. Um, after his wife passed, after six years of marriage, his sister uh, would take custody of those children. And it, it seems to me, though I can't prove it, um, the army was pretty much his entire life, and there's very little, even in his personal papers, uh, his references to his family out of 700 pages are one or two words. So very distant. They may be, he also filed his genealogy with the library. They may be in there, but um, I don't think so. So more, more. Because there are some um, early settlers in Dayton mm -hmm. that, would, that are related to my my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about the woods in Dayton, but what I can tell you is one of the pieces of the material that I pulled out of here today was for uh, a lieutenant. C.E.S. Wood, who, um, sorry, who um, also served uh, at the Department of the Columbia, he served here, he served on the staff, and they are a local family to Oregon, so I don't know if they're related to Wood. Charles Erskine Wood, you may be familiar with, also a very interesting character, but I'm not sure if that's him. Doesn't he remind I don't remember the guy's name, the movie that came out that was true, Catch Me If You Can? Well, I mean, he wants to tell me this guy. Yeah, very well could have. Um, it's really, he, um, the amazing thing is his level of consistency. He got away with it. He got away with it. Um, one of the other sections that I pulled out for, for time limits is uh, a section on entitlement. If, and I talked about it a little bit. His, the words he uses with himself and other people when he's talking to his superiors is, I deserve this. I'm entitled to this. We should all believe that. We, and I'm going to do these great things for the Army, though I haven't yet. And it's, it's, it's this tone that you get. I, I think it's, it comes back from his family and me. According to one of the papers, his family, his family was a prominent family in me. Um, and it makes him from that. He believes he deserved it. So, I was just curious, uh, you know, you talk about his relationship with the tribes and how he comes off as this, this kind of supporter of the tribe, but you really, you're really seeing him more as a, just a straight legalist. He's just looking at the, the, um, the treaty and saying, well, this is what we, we, you know, we promised in this treaty. And it's, so, so there wasn't a real relationship with well, the tribes? Well, that's, that's a... Thing there, so. uh, very good question. Um, at the beginning of uh, in figuring this out, um, I, I thought perhaps maybe he was um, strong, uh, positive to work with the tribes, an advocate, if you will. Um, and you definitely see evidence for that. But if you read the um, Status of Young Joseph, 1876, it's available, um, it's a very it's very much by the letter of the law. And if you see his writings in 1880, um, it's, it's, a, it's a more balanced, he, he wants a positive association, he wants it to be part of who he is, but um, it's, it's hard to um, make him into a positive figure for the tribes. He, he is from the legal standpoint, he is from the standpoint of from in the in the case of those negotiations, he's definitely on their on their side. If there is one, but if you even look at the, the paper I was talking about in 1876, he acknowledges that 
um, we have to, have, you know, the Wallula Valley, the non-treaty Nez Perce, uh, have occupancy rights. Occupancy, but not sovereignty. So you have that happening. So it's a very, as some of the other historians say, um, it's a very tight, defined thing. Um, I would certainly like to think when he met uh, in July uh, with uh, Chief Joseph and went around John Monteith, the, uh, the tribal agent here, um, that he, he, it was a very positive thing. It was a positive thing. It was obvious that there was trust um, and a good relationship between him and Chief Joseph and probably Olicott and those other tribal members. Um, so that, that, from that aspect, but yeah, it's a, it's a tough needle to thread because, yeah, you want to make, you may want to make him into an advocate, but he, he's not necessarily an advocate. His comments in 1880 with the Spokane, um, you probably struggle with. They're very borderline uh, racial type tone, um, but still very, you know, uh, very legalistic. Okay, what does the law say? What does the federal judge say in Olympia? Um, that type of thing. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, well, I, I guess it sounds like you're, you're kind of missing a lot of his, his personal papers too, or something. The, the, the personal like thoughts or interactions. So it, so it, it seems like he's very, very controlled the way he presented himself. And so that's, 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 maybe that's part of the, yeah. the problem. Is, so that's <laughs> yeah, very controlled. Yeah. Um, yeah, very hard to tell what, in, in terms of emotional content, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, if you read the, the minutes from the two meetings on J, uh, July 22nd and 20, or July 22nd and 23rd, 1876, it's a very, um, it's positive. It's a good tone. But does it go far enough as to point in that direction of uh, advocacy for Native Americans? I'm not sure. Well, I was just you mentioned that uh, the volumes that he studied, mm -hmm. uh, that's, there's no real biography in it. It's just basically a list of his papers and that kind of stuff, isn't it? Right. There's no biography in there. He lists his basic information like I went through, and he doesn't ask a very good question. Yeah, that would be the gold mine. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, he does say that he's happy, that he, he's uh, feeling, he doesn't really, it's very limited in terms of what he says about his interaction uh, with the tribe, in terms of emotional content, and feeling and advocacy. Yeah, unfortunately, that would be the goal line. Yeah. What led you to study him? Well, uh, nobody had written about him. No one had explored it. Maybe we not just go, wow, that's crazy. The Nez Perce War historians say, oh, here's this cool guy who did these things that look like advocacy, there's no biography on him. And then locally there's no there's no profile, there's no write up on what his feelings were or his thoughts were. And you're you're talking about thought. Getting to your question, uh, very legal legal thoughts, not personal or advocacy. So yeah, backed out. So not able to infer I can't infer from those. Yes, he's being positive towards the Native Americans, unfortunately. Any other questions? It seems like, you know, a little bit of a shyster at times. I'm very interested in his legacy. Did he um, put any of his personal items into Good question. location? I don't know. Care? I could, well, I'd be interested. I would be interested, absolutely. I would want, I, I don't know yet. Very good How many photographs have you encountered? Of him? Um, probably five to eight. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's even strong. Maybe five total exists. In terms of objects, yeah, I was thinking about that. That would, that would be really interesting, but unfortunately, no. I mean, he was a genealogist. He set up all this professional stuff of mm -hmm. his career. I don't know. But there's more stuff. Well, there could be. Um, the trick is there's no, there's no starting, there's no, uh, for historians to usually start with the existing history, sometimes and go from there. This would be truly, if you wanted to do it, you could dive into that. Um, and that's another, right, in Maine, 
and you have a family that I need to talk to about that. And he goes back to me in his retirement. But it's, like I said, many, it's kind of like the returning son who's been gone for 30 years. He's gone, we don't hear about him. The people there locally wrote, um, and this is some more content I have to cut, people locally, when he comes back, want to associate with him. So there is, there is like what you're talking about. Um, but it's not with the understanding of who he was professionally. It's, it's because he was a general. He received his generalcy after retirement. He received his Medal of Honor the day he retired. So they're all, and then he tries to revive the citation for the Medal of Honor. But in 1911, there's a document which I can get you here out of New York City. There's two copies of it. He, um, there's a woman there locally, one of his uh, peers, spouses, she writes this glowing document about him, a puff piece for lack of a better term, and this other officer, and how they encouraged her son or nephew to go to college. Well, that's great, that's, it's, it's basically a puff piece, and that's them in Maine wanting to associate themselves to play, play with. So, that does exist. Um, in terms of in Maine itself, for the newspapers, like I said, they have him leaving, they have him coming back. Um, and then because he's a general, because he was from his family, everybody now wants to be associated with him. But they don't know this, for the most part. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna use the term shyster, because that was the thought that came to my head. I meant to make a derogatory term, or, and in, not in a way, but that's kind of what some people, you know, in that case, they call that. So, well, I just have to say this because I've the whole time. Um, my ex son in law, genealogist, and has discovered all these his relatives in dating. Mm -hmm. You have described him perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding you. Well, it's just the mother's name. Well, yeah, well, I'll, 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 I don't know if they're related. Honestly, I don't. So, there were a lot of woods there at the, in the 19th century. So, hard to say. So, it's very common about saying that. See if he's got a memory clay wood in his history. It would be probably in three grades, maybe two grades. Depending on how old he is, probably three. Uh, check it out. Um, it's worth asking. So um, I think we're, we're good. I've left some cards on the back stanchion there as you walk down to the planet. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me or email me. I'll try to find out whatever I can for you and help you. Uh, this gentleman by the name of Wood. Um, but I don't know that I'm going to do that. So I, I'm sure I can, but only with what I've got here. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.